can begin. All righty. Thank you, uh, Mr. Rose. Um, let's come back from the break, please. We are back after a break uh, to uh, figure out some uh, technological challenges. Thank you, especially Vice Chair <laughs> and Mr. Davis for um, um, uh, getting that to work with Mr. Blewett. I think uh, now we'll be able to hear him uh, for the record. Uh, Mr. Blewett's screen is on the, excuse me, his slide is on the screen. Uh, Mr. Rose, go ahead. Yes, and I'll re remind the parties that Mr. Blewett's rebuttal testimony, which he's referring to, has already been admitted. So, uh, Mr. Blewett, did you hear Mr. Nichols' testimony on the Wild Earth Guardian's proposed changes to the definition of PTE? I did not hear it yesterday. I heard his comments today, and I have read his position. And do you have any response to those comments or their, the proposal? Yes, I do. And could you go ahead and give them, please? Yes. Um, the one thing, I think a good place to start here is what is the definition of, of potential to emit? And it's the maximum capacity of a stationary sort to emit under operational design. And I think this is where the issue becomes um, problematic for oil and gas, because oil and gas is a very different emission source than any other in the regulated community. It is when you drill a well, you have some belief that it's going to be a producing well, but you really don't have any idea of what, how much that well is going to produce. And you really can't determine what the, what the flow of that well or the pr production of that well is until it, well, it becomes operational. And, and I think this, the issue of um, uh, I'm there's sorry. construction going on on the Mr. Blewett, I, I'm very sorry to interrupt yeah. your testimony. We've lost um, one of our uh, council, uh, and uh, this council obviously is particularly interested in hearing your testimony. It's Mr. Nykeel. Uh So let's mm -hmm. pause for just a moment. Um, at sure. Mr. Nykeel, get back on the platform. Very sorry. I don't know if Mr. Nykiel can hear me. If you have rejoined us, Mr. Nykiel, uh, let us know. We're waiting. Thank you. I apologize okay. uh, when it rains, it pours, but I'm back. Apologize for that. Thank you. And, Go ahead, Mr. Okay. Well, and, and do we let, need let me... any of his testimony here? Um, I don't know when Mr. Nykiel ended up getting uh, being severed from this process, but we can go back if we need to. Um, if you wouldn't mind, and again, I apologize, but yeah, that would be helpful. That's, that's fine. Let, let, me, let me start by the definition of potential to emit, and it's the maximum capacity of a stationary source to emit under physical and operational design. And it's the design issue that's really different for uh, oil and gas. If you think about the, any other regulated uh, air pollution source, the issue becomes you design a plant to produce whatever, and you know what you're going to design uh, the plant to emit. Uh, for example, if you want to make windmill uh, turbine bases, 
you you design the plant to make so many windmill turbine bases per year and you calculate emissions based on on that the problem is when you drill a well you really don't know what what level that well is going to produce and because some emission sources are related to production rate you really can't estimate the potential to emit until you actually produce the well and and while you may be doing some construction of leveling the pad and things like that it's really not possible to estimate what that that potential to emit becomes and i mean this is because the flow rate of the well and emissions are related to reservoir properties and these will decrease over time and so you you have this issue that you can calculate the PTE once you produce the well but over that full first year and that's what you're really interested in is tons per year of pollutants you really need to extrapolate what the decline will be to actually get the potential to emit and in some respects PTE for a well is almost a moot point because after the first year the well will never produce at the level of of potential to emit it's it's always going to be going down okay let's go to the the second slide um and as i recall uh, as i recall what mr nichols suggested that drilling engines and and fracking engines uh be included in the pte calculations well those those that, emission sources I, i'm sorry excuse me mr Bullard, i apologize to interrupt you but i just wanted to object because that is not what mr nichols testified to okay uh so that uh, hold on uh, mr nikhil i'm going to ask you to um uh save that sort of thing for cross-examination if you would please um you can uh, establish whether uh it's been mischaracterized or not um go ahead mr blewett as as i read mr nichols uh testimony he was implying that drilling and fracking should be included in the estimation of potential to emit um those engines are non-road engines which are regulated by EPA they're only on site two or three months and then they're moved to a new location and the whole process starts again so the inclusion of those emissions is not necessarily appropriate in the determination of PTE if you Mr. Nichols characterized that you might be getting emissions coming from the well bore. Well, when you drill a well, you use drilling mud to make sure you don't have that happening because if you if you had gas flowing out of the well bore, you would be having you run the risk of having a blow up. So that's not a, a logical place. And it's when you do a completion on the well, you try to get it into a flare as quickly as you can as soon as the the emissions will burn and the, and with green completions you try to get that into the pipeline as quickly as you can so uh really that that's all i have to say um the point is that pte is complicated for wells because of decline and because you can't uh design uh an estimate of emissions because you don't really know what it's going to be and the inclusion of of drilling and fracking is really not appropriate since these are really non-road sources that are are temporary in nature and remember the drilling and fracking usually takes place in less than 2 months 
So as you as you spread those emissions over an annual period, they really become quite low. So that's that's my testimony. Madam Hearing Officer, I have no quest further questions of this witness. All right, thank you. I believe Mr. Nikeel might have some questions. Mr. Nikeel um, and Mr. Blewett, if you would stop uh, sharing your screen. Uh, I'm working on it, Madam Hearing Officer. Well, your PowerPoint's no longer up, so. Okay. Yeah. I'll I'll do it a different way. There. Uh, let's see. Do I see Mr. Nikeel on screen? Yes, I do. Uh, Mr. Nikeel, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Hearing Officer. Um, and uh, Mr. Blue, my name is Matt Nikeel. I'm here on behalf of Wild Earth Guardians. Uh, I apologize for interrupting you earlier, um, but good morning. Uh, I just have a couple questions for you. Um, you agree that emissions of NOx and VOCs from oil and gas facilities can cause and contribute to exceedances of the ozone NAx. Is that right? Um, I will agree in a limited sense. I'm not sure that VOCs are a major contributor based on the work that Ramble has done. NOx, okay. is, NOx is appropriate and is a controlling issue. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, are ozone precursor emissions emitted during wellhead construction? Very small. You have some minor diesel engines uh, involved in that. Typically those emissions are quantified and modeled during any type of EIS analysis. So they have been, they have been in a, analyzed and they're shown to be uh, rather insignificant and modeling is typically done to show that there are no exceedances of the PM10 and PM2.5 standards as a result of that work. Okay, did, did you provide an EIS to that effect in your uh, testimony or rebuttal? Yes, I did. As a matter of fact, I, I included the Mancos um, EIS, uh, my comments on the Mancos EIS as part of my, te my testimony. Okay, um, one other uh, line of questioning. Um, in your rebuttal, you testified that uh, guardians claimed that oil and gas emissions are directly and solely responsible for increased exceedances in New Mexico and other areas where oil and gas development has occurred. Is that right? Yes, I did. And I, and I disagree with your position. The position I, that I, I, let me finish. The position that I inferred from Mr. Nichols' testimony was there, there are two situations where oil and gas has solely con caused e exceedances of the ozone next. Those are in the Greater Green Basin in Wyoming and in the Uinta Basin in Utah. I was involved in the research on both of those areas and those exceedances are caused by very unique meteorological conditions. They occur during the winter time with fresh snow and fresh snow is very important. Uh, a low level temperature inversion, which contains the emissions and causes uh, concentration of them, very low wind speeds and very stable conditions. Under those very specific cases, you see exceedances of the standard in, in the wintertime. Those conditions have not been seen in New Mexico and are probably not likely to be seen in New Mexico. So to say in any other situation that monit monitoring reflects oil and gas contribution is inappropriate because the monitor tells you total concentration. The 
model can get, provide you source apportionment, and you've seen those results in the RAMBO work. Mr. Blewett, um, I have a very specific question I want to ask you. I'm going to restate it again, and just a yes or no would be fine, um, but I'm going to re-ask the question. You submitted rebuttal testimony, and in that you testified that guardians claimed that oil and gas emissions are directly and solely responsible for increased exceedances in New Mexico and other areas where oil and gas development has occurred. Yes or no? I said yes, and I, 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 you, I made statements, and I truly believe that your statement is false. And the I gave you examples of, of where it isn't. It is true, and otherwise, you can't make that claim solely. So the answer is yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Blewett. Uh, do you happen to have Wild Earth Guardians Exhibit 3 in front of you titled Direct Technical Testimony of Jeremy, ne Jeremy Nichols? Uh, no, I do not. Madam Hearing Officer, may I have permission to uh, share my screen? Yes, I'll do that now. Apologies, I'm just um, granting permission to myself to allow um, the screen to be shared. Anyway, figure that out. Well, um, can't, it's not allowing me to share. I'm trying to. Madam Hearing Officer, have you um, guided anyone through problems with preferences before? Um, no, I, you are the presenter uh, at this moment. I just double checked. Um, if it might be simpler, and if what you're going to refer to is, um, for example, narrative testimony, you might just um, uh, read the pertinent part and ask Mr. Blewett to assume that it's true. Yeah, I think I'm fine with that. Um, I will do my best um, not being able to share at the moment, um, and I will continue. Um, Maybe this will work. Mr. Blewett, um, do you, could you point us to the page number in Wild Earth Guardians Exhibit 3, which is uh, Mr. Nichols's direct testimony, and point us to the page number where he uses the word directly? I don't have it in front of me, so I can't point to that. Okay. And I'm just going to ask this uh, to preserve it on the record at this point, but um, could you point point us to the page number in Wild Earth Guardians Exhibit 3 where Mr. Nichols used the word solely? No. Okay. 
And could you point us to the page number of Mr. Nichols's uh, direct test uh, uh, technical testimony where uh, Mr. Nichols used the word uh, drilling engine? He used the word drilling, and I assumed that that meant engines. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Cole Kleischer. And in hearing officer, I'd like to raise an objection. The witness has stated that he does not have the document in front of him. So these repeated the witness has stated that he does not have the document in front of him. These repeated questions to point to a page number don't seem useful and they don't seem to be in the spirit of our earlier conversation about attorneys sort of policing themselves to move along in an expeditious manner. All right. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Mr. Cole Kleischer, but I um, will overrule that to the extent it's an objection. Uh, I believe Mr. Nikeel is trying to establish that he believes Mr. Blewett has mischaracterized Mr. Nichols' testimony, and that was the, the quickest way to do it. Um, Mr. Nikeel, do you have other questions of Mr. Blewett? No further questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me pause for a moment in the event any other party has questions of Mr. Blewett based on his testimony just now. Oh, I see Mr. Rose on the screen. Mr. Rose. No, I had no further <clears throat> no further questions of this witness and no redirect, Madam Hearing Officer. I've been on the whole time, so. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Blewett. Um, I'm going to turn now to Thank you, board. Madam Hearing. Hold, hold on. The board now uh, gets to question you. Um, so I'm going to turn to the board for their questions. Uh, and uh, while I'm doing that, in the event you're on the platform and have a question, uh, as an attendee, uh, please reach out through the chat. Madam Chair, do you have questions of Mr. Blewett? Thank you, Madam Hearing Officer. Uh, I don't have any questions at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Chair Trujillo Davis. I do not have any questions either. Uh, thank you, Mr. Blewett. Thank you. Uh, Mr. K uh, Member Cates. Uh, no questions here. Thank you. Thank you. Member Bitzer. Uh, no questions, Madam Hearing Officer. Uh, Member Duval. No questions. Thank you. Uh, Member Garcia. No questions. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Blewett. And Member Honker. Uh, no questions. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Blewett. Uh, we can excuse you now for the for the time being. Thank you. Thank you very much for your, your help. Bye. Thank you. All right. Uh, and uh, whom do we hear from next? I believe Mr. Heiser said that we won't be hearing from uh, Namoga anymore on this topic. Uh, so, Ms. Uh, Katz, uh, do I understand you have some sir rebuttal? Oh, I, wait a minute. I see Ms. Spall on the screen, Ms. Spall. Commercial Disposal Group has testimony on this subject matter. All right, so we'll go to Commercial Disposal Group first. If you would call your witness. Yes, uh, my witness is Il Kim. Ah, uh, I believe I saw witness Kim and have just um, panelized the witness. Um, will you require screen sharing privileges? No. Okay, thank you thank very you. much. I'm not yet seeing the witness on screen. Oh, there we go. Oh, hello, Mr. Kim. Uh, Hi. Let's check your sound. Yeah, how does it sound? I think it's good. Thank you. Uh, would you raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth? I do. Thank you. And if you would spell your name and make sure to um, give us a heads up as to any exhibits near the beginning here. Uh, my name is Il Kim, spelled I-L, last name Kim, K-I-M. Whenever you're ready, Ms. Spall. Okay, thank you. Um, good morning, members of the board. 
I am Casey Spall representing the commercial disposal group. Um, Mr. Kim's written testimony is Appendix A to the group's um, notice of intent and his uh, CV is attached as attachment A. His rebuttal testimony is Appendix A to the commercial disposal group's notice of intent to file rebuttal testimony. Uh, Mr. Kim, please state your name, employer and position for the board. My name is Il Kim. I'm a senior air permitting engineer and I work for NGL Energy Partners LP. And can you briefly summarize um, your experience relevant to this rulemaking and the testimony you'll provide? Yeah, I have uh, over 10 years of experience in various consulting and oil and gas firms as an air quality technical advisor for oil and gas operators, uh, as well as other industries. I've managed air quality permitting, uh, compliance programs, due diligence reviews, uh, numerous environmental projects uh, that also include ESG, greenhouse gas calculations, uh, and sustainability. Um, and I, you know, one of my big tasks are to just ensure regulatory requirements are met. Thank you. And have you prepared direct and rebuttal testimony in these proceedings? Uh, yes, I have. Uh, I submitted direct testimony regarding regarding one hydrocarbon liquid transfers and two storage tank vessels. Uh, I submitted rebuttal testimony on the same topics as well as definition of tank battery. And if I ask you today, um, in your direct and rebuttal testimony, would you say the same thing that you did in your written testimony? Yes. Thank you. And do you adopt that, adopt that testimony here today? Yes. Um, before I ask Mr. Kim for a verbal summary of his testimony and his position on the department's current proposal, I offer his written direct and rebuttal testimony into the record. Uh, thank you, Ms. Spall. I don't remember that there were objections uh, to okay. your exhibits, but let me pause for a moment in the event there are. No, the exhibits are admitted. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Kim, in the last red line that we received from uh, NMED, the department determined that it was unnecessary to include a definition of tank battery in the proposed rule. Um, do you agree that a definition is not needed in this rule? Yes, uh, the group supports the decision not to include a definition of tank battery into the proposed rule because it has already been defined elsewhere in the New Mexico Administrative Code in section 20.2.38.7e. And uh, Mr. Kim, does that conclude your testimony on this issue? Yes. Thank you. He's now available for cross-examination. Thank you, Ms. Fahala and Mr. Kim. I'm going to pause a moment in the event other parties have questions of Mr. Kim. Please uh, turn on your screen. All right, I'm going to turn to the board for their questions. While I'm doing that, if you are an attendee on this platform and have a question, please reach out through the chat. Madam Chair, do you have questions of Mr. Kim? Thank you, Madam Hearing Officer. I don't have any questions at this time. Thank you, Vice Chair Torio Davis. I don't have any uh, questions either. Thank you, Mr. Kim. Uh, Member Capes. Yeah, no questions here, thank you. Member Bitzer. No questions, Madam Hearing Officer, thank you. Thank you, Member Duvall. Uh, no, Madam Chair. Member Garcia. No questions, thank you. Thank you, and Member Honker. Uh, yeah, one question, uh, since I don't have the New Mexico Administrative Code in front of me, can you explain well, the context for the definition elsewhere in the code? Yes, so uh, the definition uh, is located in another section of the New Mexico Administrative Code. Um, the definition defines a uh, tank battery as a tank or group of tanks that receive crude oil or condensate from a well or storage uh, or storage until shipment.
And is that in uh, in a UIC context, or what what uh, portion of the code is that? I believe that is hydrocarbon storage facilities. Uh, it's it's for the oil and gas portion of of the uh, New Mexico Administrative Code. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, will there be any uh, follow up or redirect, Ms. Spall? No, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you uh, for your testimony, Mr. Kim. We'll excuse you for now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Katz, is it time for your server bottle? Yes, Madam Hearing Officer, and um, uh, the department would call Michael Baca. And well, I Baca needed to be the base panelist. I don't know if you did that. I did that. Uh, okay. Will he uh, have slides? Um, there will be no slides. All right, thank you. You're still under oath, Mr. Baca. Thank you. Um, Mr. Baca, um, can you uh, discuss the department's uh, position regarding the additional language proposed by Wild Earth Guardians uh, with respect to the definition of potential to emit? Can you hear me? Thank you. So NMED opposes the inclusion of this additional language to the definition of PTE um, because we want to maintain consistency with the definition um, as provided in the department's permitting programs. Um, so while NMED regulates equipment located at well sites, um, we do not approve permits to drill. Um, that is OCD's jurisdiction. So in effect, um, you know, it, it could be taken that Mr. Nichols is requesting the department to expand our own jurisdiction um, to include activities that are regulated by another agency. Um, additionally, Mr. Nichols did not specify any equipment um, that or provide any data for emissions, control options, um, technical feasibility or costs associated with these um, undefined source types. So the department has no way of determining what emissions um, we might be talking about here. Um, so there, there's no real way to review and vet what, what his actual idea or proposal is. Um, and we have some concerns with the report that he is using um, to, to make his claims. So th this is not a report that has undergone any sort of peer review or been published in any scientific journal. Um, the methods by which the data collection and analysis were conducted um, were not really detailed in any way. Um, and that goes the same way for how they did their conclusions. So there is no um, data presented on how they found their correlations. Um, there's no statistics to show um, that there is a causal relationship or any um, real kind of relationship beyond um, what, what is provided um, to us. Um, it's kind of unclear. You know, they, they, he said that they looked at permits and decided that they were related, um, there, there's no established criteria for determining that. So we feel that these claims are uns unsubstantiated and they should not be rel relied upon by the board um, for this requested addition to the rule. Thank you, Mr. Baca. That's all we have on that point. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me ask the other parties to um, Turn on their screen in the event they have questions. Um, I see Mr. Rose and Mr. Heiser. Mr. Rose, go ahead. Oh, thank you, Madam Hearing Officer. Uh, Mr. Baca, um, are you familiar with the way the term PTE is used in these proposed regulations? I am somewhat familiar with that, yes, sir. And and do you have an opinion or does the department have an opinion on if this board were to adopt Wild Earth Guardian's proposal, how that would affect application of the term in the way it's being used in the proposed regs, whether it's appropriate? Yes, I, I was not directly related in the development of the PT definition, but I can speak to, I think maybe my own um, on that thinking that you you know I, I do think that if you don't 
properly classify the sources that we're regulating as to size, then you can apply the correct requirements to those um, applicable to those sources. And, and I take it that that the cutoffs or the, the thresholds that the department's proposing in these rules was predicated on a definition of potential to emit that did not include the, the types of emissions that uh, Mr. Nichols is proposing be included? I would agree with that. Thank you, Madam Hearing Officer. I have no further questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Heiser and then Mr. Nikeel. Sorry, um, Mr. Baca, is the department's position sort of that permitting is in part 72 and not really appropriate here for part 50? Uh, yes, sir. And I'll get to that um, a little later in, in um, the hearing in the proceeding, but definitely okay. this is not a permitting role. This is a, a mission standards role. All right, then I have no further questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Nikeel. Yes, thank you, Madam Hearing Officer. Just a few questions. Um, Mr. Baca, my name is Matt Nikeel. I'm with Wild Earth Guardians. Um, good morning. Um, the first question I have is, do you agree that NMAD is responsible for regulating stationary point sources of ozone precursors? I believe I just testified to that effect. Okay. And if there are stationary point sources involved in the construction of oil and gas wells that emit ozone precursors, would you also agree that the department is responsible for regulating those emissions? Well, I mean, it would depend upon what sources you're talking about. I think you really need to um, specify what we're talking about here in order to properly address and, um, and speak to those issues. Okay. Um, so, for example, what about the well borehole? I would not be qualified to talk to that. I'm not. I'm not exactly sure what you're referring to. With Objection. Okay. Um, Mr. Uh, Nikeel, his client did not specify. I don't believe any equipment in his testimony regarding this issue. All right. Um, do you want to uh, rephrase that, uh, Mr. Nikeel, or move on? Um, well, I just asked that because it, um, Mr. Nichols gave that example as an answer to a question of the board. Okay. Um, do you have other questions of Mr. Baca? Yes. Um, One moment. <clears throat> you testified that the uh, definition of potential to emit proposed by the department is consistent with the definition in the federal regulations. Yes, I did testify to that. Okay. And. No, I'm, no. So, I'm sorry. I, I testified that it is consistent with the department's permitting programs. Okay. And the way that we uh, calculate PTA and all that. Okay. Um, is, uh, is there any language in the Clean Air Act that precludes the board from adding clarity to the definition of potential to emit? Um, in this rule, I, I don't think there would be, but I don't believe that what is being proposed would add any clarity. I actually believe that it would provide more um, confusion. Um, and like I spoke to you before, we, we're not even specifying what pieces of equipment we're talking about in this proposal. So there's no way for me to really uh, give you a good answer on, on a lot of what we're talking about now. It's all in hypotheticals. Okay. Um, I think that'll do. Thank you. No further questions. All right. Thank you, Mr. Nikeel. Uh, any other party wish to turn on their screen for questions of Mr. Baca? 
no. All right, I'm going to move to the board questions. If you're an attendee on this platform and have a question, Mr. Baca, please reach out through the chat. Uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Hearing Officer. Um, I don't have any questions at this time. Thank you, Vice Chair Trujillo Davis. I don't either. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Member Cates. Uh, no questions here. Thank you. Member Bitzer. Uh, no questions. Thank you. Thank you, Member Duvall. I have one um, for Mr. Baca. Could you explain why it would be problematic that there's not a more sophisticated statistical analysis in the data you specifically mentioned that um, like correlation was referred to, but there wasn't the uh, like an, an actual rigorous statistical analysis. Right, and nor was it no protocol provided for how the actual um, study was conducted. So um, to actually, you know, evaluate what we would, uh, you know, for to design this sort of study, you'd probably need to develop what's called a quality assurance project plan, which would outline what your data quality objectives were. And, you know, you, you design your study to meet those DQOs and make sure that you're not introducing any um, undue influence into your findings. So that, that was not um, properly explained to, to me and, and it didn't give me any basis to really um, give any credence to the report. So um, getting to the findings, you know, that, that's, you know, once they determine that these are the facilities, you know, I'm not sure how they're really um, saying that this is, is, is a problem or there's a causal problem or you know, how, they, how are they relating what they found um, could be possibly a violation to what they're, what they're um, representing as findings in this report. And in, in dealing with NMED, is, is it common practice that a QAQC, quality assurance, quality control protocol would be provided? For any study that, that NMED does, um, our monitoring networks have QAPPs. Um, any study that I have done regarding, um, you know, field work, there's QAPPs involved with those. So the department does do that. Um, any of the other reports that I've seen of this type of nature do cite, have citations to them. They do explain their methods. Um, they do provide the data, the underlying data that's um, available to, to everyone. Um, and so I, I just had concerns with um, kind of the way the way it was presented and um, what about that? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Member Garcia. No questions, thank you. And Member Hawker. No questions, thank you. Thank you. Uh, any follow up, Ms. Katz? Nothing from me, Madam Hearing Officer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Baca, for your testimony. And Ms. Katz, is this the end of the testimony on topic uh, 21? Okay, 21. All right. <clears throat> Madam Hearing Officer, before we go on, just a housekeeping item. Yes, sir. Um, in uh, Mr. Nakiel's examination of Mr. Blewett, they referenced an environmental impact statement or comments on it, which is IPA and M Exhibit 9, I believe. <clears throat> and I don't remember whether we'd offered it and had it admitted. So I just want to make sure that that if if we hadn't, that it that we go ahead and, and offer it, be admitted at this point. Uh, my memory was that all IPA and M exhibits were admitted. If that's the case, Madam Hearing Officer, then, then I think we're fine. All right, and thank you for pointing that out though for uh, the board's benefit. They can refer to exhibit nine. Thank you for that. All right, um, Ms. Katz. Thank you. Um, so, so for now we're on. If we're on exhibit, uh, sorry, topic 
22 now, um, then I'm calling um, Elizabeth Bisbee Keen again for that. Thank you. And the uh, for the board, this topic is in an um, MED exhibit thirty two um, pages. Let's see, page three through seven, and page twenty three uh, through twenty four, um, and then. Uh, NMED rebuttal exhibit one, and I don't have a page number. <laughs> I'm sorry for that. Um, all right, and we have a uh, PowerPoint on this one. I'm sorry, Ms. Couch, what did you say the um, first exhibits were? Um, that was NMED exhibit 32. And that's the, that's going to be the um, exhibit for all of the rest of this testimony on the the rule provisions from NMED. And, um, there's a table of contents associated with it, and of course I had it in front of me and I wrote down things on it, but I can't find it at the moment. <laughs> um, and it was pages. Page three through seven and page 23 through 24. And um, Liz, we are, I don't believe we are here yet. I believe we are still on topic, or we're on general provisions. Oh, sorry, I have the wrong number in here. It should be section 20.2.50.111. <laughs> All right. Um, this is the correct um, section number 112. So where okay. you where, where it's wrong, where are you referring to the? So we are not on this topic. We're not on this section yet. We are in applicability. So, okay, so, so we, 111. So we just finished the definition of PTE in the previous topic. So now we are in section 111 applicability, I believe, or no, which we, which we finished yesterday. We finished yesterday. And Sorry, that's 112. Okay. <laughs> that's okay. No, Sorry, just, this is all so confusing. That's okay. I just wanted to make sure we're all you're all right. right. Okay. And Madam Hearing Officer, Ms. K Ms. Um, Katz, uh, I'm just making sure the same references are for. The no, 12. they're not. Okay. Sorry, this is my fault. No um, problem. Thank you. Let's see. Okay, so for this one, the reference, the page references are uh, NMED page uh, exhibit 32, page 24 for, through 30. And NMED rebuttal exhibit one, 21 through 27. My apologies for that. All right, Ms. Keene, um, you have um, submitted your testimony on this already and adopted it. Um, can you please um, give us an overview of? the general provisions at 20.2.50.112. Yes, uh, this section, the general provisions section establishes a universal set of requirements applicable to all the sources that are subject to part 50. And they include operational monitoring, record keeping and reporting requirements. They establish work practice standards and requirements to operate equipment in accordance with manufacturer specifications. And we did receive uh, several comments on the section and made revisions in response to those comments to clarify um, what specifications may be followed to ensure equipment is operated 
properly and maintained. And so on this slide before you is um, condition um, A1, which outlines um, those um, that universal set of requirements to um, maintain, operate, and maintain equipment in accordance with manufacturer specifications. We received comments from the industry partners um, seeking clarification um, on what types of specifications may be used to comply with this requirement. We made significant revisions in response to those comments and have addressed um, those comments, I believe, satisfactorily. I'm not going to belabor all the revisions that we made, but I will be able to answer any specific questions that any uh, board members have. This slide um, is, it, sorry, I'll, I'll just proceed if that's okay. Yes. Ms. Katz, okay. The second uh, condition establishes a general duty clause to minimize emissions um, and also requirement to develop a database system capable of storing the compliance information for equipment subject to this part. Our initial proposal had a requirement to um, physically tag uh, monitoring um, for monitoring equipment and the, the requirement to physically tag sources that are subject to this rule have been removed. Um, we received extensive feedback from, again, the industry stakeholders on um, the, the concept of the EMT, um, that it was not technically feasible, and NMUD um, agreed to, to scale um, those requirements to a, to a simplified form, which still but the preserves the intent um, to, to monitor and capture that monitoring data contemporaneously and track that information in, uh, in, a, in some type of database system, which I will speak to in detail later. Um, so changes to this paragraph two in front of you today reflect the comments that were received by the department to clarify um, under what uh, circumstances air pollution control equipment and monitoring equipment shall be maintained. Um, we, we made these changes in response to comments and we think that they um, have resolved the, the issues that were identified by, by the industry parties. And again, I'm not gonna go into detail here about what the revisions were um, that were made, but I can be available for any specific questions that board members have. What is before you today is um, additional clarifications that we made um, to the one second to the paragraphs um, within paragraph three and the sub paragraphs within that section. This provided uh, clarifications that um, were necessary to um, specify what type of um, emissions were required to be kept and other minor edits that um, don't substantively, substantively change the intent of this, this section. Um, and then we've deleted, of course, the requirement to install an equipment monitoring tag. And we've clarified the, uh, the information um, that has to be maintained in the compliance um, database system. The slide before you um, reflect additional edits that the department made in response to industry comments on um, that concept of the database uh, system. We clarified that final reports must be entered into that system within three business days. Um, clarified that NMED will uh, develop a list of approved technologies to meet the, um, the new uh, contemporaneous tracking system. And before you in paragraph 8B is how the department intends to um, work with stakeholders on identifying the type of technologies that think will comply with the requirement of this part. And so um, we've outlined a timeline here for the department to work with stakeholders to identify um, techn those technologies. And the department intends to post um, those approved technologies by um, April 1st, uh, uh, by January 1st, 2023, and then get, provides an additional um, three months for operators or four months to comply with that new tracking system. 
And Ms. Keene, this um, just for clarification that this relates to the requirement for um, date and time stamping um, monitor monitoring um, events that are required under this section. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Um, the department received re comments regarding um, the third party audit requirement that appears in this section and agreed uh, to the revision that the department um, shall be limited to requiring those third party audits. Third party audits at least uh, no more than once per year. Um, the department also added a provision which was necessary to identify um, which federal standard to the extent that the regulation is referring to a federal standard or requirement. We need to um, specify which federal standard or requirement um, we were referring to. And so that paragraph 10 before you specifies or clarifies that to the extent that part 50 is referring to applicable federal standards or requirements, um, we are referring to those standards that were in effect at the time of the effective date of this part. And Ms. Keen, can I take you back up to um, paragraph nine and just make clear that the third party audit um, relates to um, the auditing of data and information that's collected and reported in that database report that the department can request. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Yes, and I should add, I'm sorry, that there's an important addition that was in, made in response to comments that the owner or operator may request a hearing on whether good cause was demonstrated by the department. Um, to require that audit. To, to require the audit, that's correct. Um, Paragraph 11 was necessary to clarify that um, prior to modifying an existing source, the owner or operator must uh, reevaluate the applicability or the potential applicability of part 50 to that source. So that clarifies that um, you, you do need to reevaluate a source's applicability under this part um, prior to making some type of modification to a piece of equipment that could increase the emissions and bring that unit um, under the requirements of this this rule. And can I go back to once, sorry, once more, because I think we missed one other aspect of the um, third party audit and the hearing that a hearing can also be requested um, to if the recommendations provided by uh, for the owner or operator to challenge the recommendations that were um, made by the third party auditor. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. This slide um, refers to the provides a summary of the general monitoring requirements under the general provisions. Um, we received uh, requests for um, from the industry parties that when we were referring to the term monitoring that we um, add monitoring, testing, or inspection within the meaning of that term. And we've added this first paragraph in order to clarify that. Uh, when the term monitoring is used in this part, it includes um, monitoring of equipment and testing or inspection requirements. And then we made other minor, um, minor edits to refer to the, the concept of an alternative monitoring strategy, which is limited to the the Eldar or the fugitive leak section, which we'll get to um, on Monday. And Ms. King, can you just briefly touch on what the monitoring requirements are here? Just briefly summarize them. Sure. So th this uh, requires owners and operators to conduct a monthly inspection of equipment unless that a different schedule is specified in the section to that source type. So this is a this is a baseline equipment check that's done once per month on equipment subject to this part. This is a, a slide that, again that summarizes the general monitoring requirements. Um, we did receive comments. Um, requesting the, the deletion of some information that may have that was duplicative be as it appeared in other sections and so um, 
the department agreed that um, the, this list of specific monitoring requirements were duplications of, of the monitoring requirements in the specific sections. And so we've we've made this requirement more concise. This slide covers the general record keeping requirements um, that require the, the actual recording of of monitoring that's required under this under the general provisions. Uh, we re revised the rec record keeping requirement to clarify um, what, who can conduct the record the record as required by this part. Um, we deleted language in paragraph two um, because the department is already available is already able to um, to treat loss or or failure to maintain a record as um, as a failure to collect that data in our enforcement actions. We've also added a new provision um, in paragraph three that requires an annual compliance evaluation and certification of all the terms and conditions of this part. We think this is uh, an essential um, compliance certification of the requirements of this part. And if operators are correctly monitoring and record keeping um, and conducting the, the proper record keeping of records required under this part, the compilation of this data into an annual compliance certification should be um, fairly straightforward and should not um, require a, you know, additional resources. Um, this section, I'll, so we're speaking, um, can, sorry, yeah. can you just go back please and um, discuss the removal of the, um, the, the uh, pre, before transferring the, the compliance? Sure. <laughs> sorry. No, that's okay. And we received extensive comment from stakeholders. Um, on the on a, on a previous requirement in, in the proposal that required owners and operators to um, conduct a full compliance evaluation before the transfer of equipment. We agreed that um, it was improper to to have that um, analysis conducted prior to transfer of ownership. And so we have instead replaced that requirement with the annual compliance certification. This slide speaks to the general reporting provisions of the part and also to the definition of construction. The department received um, requests about the, the need for additional time to provide reports. And especially for those instances where we're requiring information on multiple facilities. And so the department made revisions to allow uh, three business days to provide that information and also um, the option to give additional time is appropriate for multiple requests. Uh, and the definition of construction was was updated. And I know we spoke to moving this to the engines and turbines section, so we can speak to that again um, when we get to engines and turbines. Um, but um, it was originally intended to be included within the scope of this of this section, and so I'll, it, it's here before you today, and I can just go through. The, the changes that were made, um, which are important um, and are in line with other requirements, which excludes relocations or like kind replacements from triggering the definition of construction under the rule. And that's the end of the presentation. Thank you, Ms. Keene. I don't have any more questions on this section. Uh, thank you, Ms. Keene and Ms. Katz. Uh, let me invite uh, Council to come on screen. I see Ms. Gutierrez. Do you have questions of Ms. Keene? I do. Thank you, Madam Hearing Officer. Um, thank you, Ms. Keene, for your presentation today. I do have what I think is just one quick clarifying question. Um, and if it's helpful, I'm referring to your slide seven of your slide deck. Uh, and this question relates to the monitoring requirements at paragraph B1 of section 112, 
So I think as we all read that that requires monthly monitoring quote, unless a different schedule is specified in the section applicable to that source type end quote. However, in exhibit 32 page 28 to the department's direct testimony, um, your testimony states that this section 112 quote is the minimum periodic requirement for sources subject to part 50 end quote. So the use of, of the term minimum creates a little bit of confusion there. My question is, can you confirm that it is not the department's intent to require monthly mon monitoring in each section as the minimum frequency? Rather, if the specific section has a frequency, um, that frequency is the authority. It, it is the department's intent that owners and operators conduct a monthly inspection of equipment subject to this part. And that establishes a baseline set of requirements unless a more frequent inspection schedule is specified. So the clarification here is that um, these, these are industrial sources with industrial equipment, that there is a, an expectation that operators conduct a monthly inspection of that equipment unless a, unless a more frequent inspection schedule is necessary. So maybe perhaps just a follow up question there, um, because we have different frequencies in, for example, the leak detection that are less frequent than monthly. This monthly monitoring at 112 would not overturn what is in section 116. It would not specific. No, it would not overturn the those frequencies in 116. And similarly, in the pig launching and receiving section, there are certain frequencies for inspection that may be less frequent than monthly um, if you are not pigging or launching as frequently as monthly. And I, think this section make, would, I, think, I think we can make a clarification on the rule that speaks to those specific circumstances. Okay, thank you and no further questions. Thank you, Ms. Gutierrez. I saw Mr. Heiser on the screen. Thank you, Madam Hearing Officer. Good morning, Ms. Keene. Uh, first of all, we'd like to say thank you for all going through all these many comments that you've received and obviously giving consideration to many of them. One of the ones that I think is important for us is the idea of the compliance database system that the department has introduced in this rule. And in some cases that appears as a system, in some cases it appears as systems, in some cases it is system with the S inside parentheses. And I just wanted to clarify that your general intent was that we can have multiple systems involved in supplying the information so long as we're able to produce the CDR within the required time frame or the other information within the required time frame. That's correct. Okay. Um, in the discussion where you talked about the uh, date and time stamp, um, have you done any evaluation of the cost from the department's perspective of how much that would cost us to do across the state or at least across the affected counties, excuse me. So that is not necessarily an, an added um, system that has to be deployed that can be implemented, I think, and through in the current compliance monitoring program that owners and operators already implement. We are hoping to identify um, apps that can be um, that are hopefully you know free to download that can contain the type of information that we would like to be recorded contemporaneously with the monitoring event. Okay, but at this point in time, and I think as you've laid out in your proposal, you haven't identified those, and so you're asking the board to say, trust the bureau. We're going to be able to come up with something that works to all parties. Well, there's there are many um, existing apps that you can download that have date time stamp um, options for those, and so um, I have no doubt that we'll be able to identify a suite of technologies that can meet the intent of that requirement. And we are not um, we are going to the the plan is to work with um, industry parties on identifying technologies that meet that intent, and so. I have no um, doubt that we will be able to identify the technologies that meet the intent. Have you done any database development work within the Air Quality Bureau? We are frequently working on database development. 
And how, how long does it take for a typical database development project to go from start to finish? It, can, it will take a couple of years, and we've given a couple of years in the role as um, timeline to, to develop and build up that system. Thank you. Um, in the, the same section on date and timestamp, just a question about how you would how you're looking at implementing that, because, of course, as industry, we're like, well, how do we deal with this in the field? If there's a GPS unavailability or device failure, are you expecting us not to do or to delay or to repeat the maintenance activity or inspection in that situation because we're required to do the date and time stamp in order to do the device? And so we need guidance from you about how to handle device failures or device unavailability. Can you give a little bit of thought perhaps and how you believe that the Bureau is looking at handling that? I think we would, um, there needs to be some reasonable understanding that equipment failures happen and uh, the, um, that the monitoring should go on, um, that the monitoring event should go on in the, in, in the circumstance where you have um, some kind of GPS malfunction and you're unable to make that demonstration in the, at that time. Thanks, that's really helpful for us as we're looking at this. Um, then, Later on in the rule, we appreciate that the department has removed the discussion about the tree transfer certification and you've now substituted in an annual compliance certification, I think, in March of each year. And the first first question I have for you is just looking at the trajectory of this rulemaking that first certification. If this rule were to be adopted prior to March of 2022. That would put us with only a couple of days to implement that proceeding. Uh, proceeding is that something that you would be considerate of, perhaps pushing it out so we have about a year before the first one comes into effect? Yes, yes, I think that's very reasonable, and I think we can extend that deadline to um, give a year um, after the effective date of the rule to put that um, put that in place. I think we'd appreciate that, and I'm sure that Ms. Orth and the board would appreciate not having that deadline as part of. The things hanging over them. Um, the second thing I had for that is, have you estimated, or do you have an estimate in your in the department's mind, how many individual sources, as you've used the term, would be subject to this annual compliance certification? Because we've heard that there's like 30, I guess nearly 50,000 wells or somewhere in that range, and but wells are only one part of this uh, rule if you add all the other pieces of equipment, do we have some sense of how many pieces of equipment are potentially covered? It depends on the facility and the, the universe of equipment that they have on the site and whether or not that equipment is subject to the part. But the certification requirement, doesn't it go to each of the individual sources identified in your rule? It does, correct. So the sort of yeah so the individual certification will be per facility and the per facility um will and the number of sources will be dependent on the type of facility that that that, that facility is and so a well site facility may have 10 pieces of equipment that are subject to this part a gas processing plant may have 20 pieces of equipment that are subject to the part yeah and um so if anyway it's going to be 100 hundred thousand at least probably just thinking about the number of facilities that we have have you given a thought to how much time in the department's view you would have to spend on each of those individual sources to prepare that compliance certification so we're not re we're not requiring that information to be reported to us is your question how have we anticipated how long it's going to take you all to determine? Yes, how long, how long it would take us to do that for each of these individual sources? I think if so, if owners and operators are are complying with the monitoring and record keeping requirements that are in the rule, it should that that information on that record should already exist. And so I, this will be a compilation of those existing records into a certification report, which I think should be automatic if you have a. a a good man equipment environmental management uh, system in place. So as the department was looking at this, this was more using our CDR database system to undertake that evaluation and to you know basically query that to make sure that the sources are are in compliance as we're preparing to make that certification. You're correct. Thank you. That's a very that's.
for us to understand what the department is thinking of for our obligations. Um, then, um, in the very last section, we had proposed and you had accepted a provision giving a little bit more discretion in how much time we had to respond if, say, we were to receive a request for 20 facilities at a time, for example. And in your testimony, you say would, but in the language, you say may. And there's a big difference between would and may. <laughs> Are you guys willing to consider possibly a little bit more affirmative statement on that one word, maybe a will? It still leaves you the discretion to determine how much time to grant, but it's a little bit stronger that if there's a large number of facilities, we will get some extra time. Yes, we can we can agree to that. Uh, I believe that that completes the questions that I had for you, just mostly the nature of clarifying what the department's intents were. We appreciate your time on this, really we do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Heiser. Uh, let me see, Mr. Nightkill, I see you on screen. Thank you, Madam Hearing Officer. Just a few questions. Uh, good morning, Ms. Kuhn. Um, the annual compliance certification um, in the proposed rule, that is not required to be submitted to the department, is it? No, it is not. And for the compliance database reports, um, those are also not required to be submitted to the department unless, or unless there's a request from the department for one or more. That's correct. And that's in, that's consistent with how most air regulatory agencies handle um, that type of record keeping. Thank you. Okay, any other parties with questions of Ms. Keene on this topic? Not seeing any new screens. I'm going to turn to the board members for their questions. While I'm doing that, if you're an attendee on this platform and would have a question, please reach out through the chat. Uh, Madam Chair, do you have questions? Thank you, Madam Hearing Officer. Yes, I, ha I have a couple of questions. Um, thank you again for your testimony, Ms. Keene. Um, I just want to um, have it clarified in, in my head. Um, you had mentioned during your testimony that, and, and I could see, um, in real time, uh, some of the industry representatives um, uh, and your interaction about <clears throat> the language and about ne basically negotiating the language. As um, for any of these items that you spoke about in this portion of your testimony, did you get um, any other feedback from other organizations other than the industry on these? Madam Chair, we did not. Okay. And um, to the annual compliance certification, I know also in public testimony, we heard some concerns from uh, some folks from the public regarding some of the added monitoring and compliance uh, measures being proposed. Um, from your perspective um, and your interaction with the industry, <clears throat> um, is there still that a, a large concern about the added um, costs that the certifications and the monitoring will will be on the um, on the industry. Um, Madam Chair, I'm, I misspoke, and I, I so I believe Wild Earth Guardians did submit um, comments on the on the general provisions section, and um, I apologize for that error. Um, but I want to cl make the, clear the record on that point. Okay. And in is as far as costs go, we are uh, we we are aware that there are concerns about added costs of 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 implementing the rule. However, uh, the the cornerstone, the keystone of any uh, any emission standard is is demonstrating compliance with that emission standard. And so you you need to have um, associated monitoring of that equipment and some type of record that the monitoring was conducted to ensure compliance with that standard. And so um, it necessarily follows that you you must have some type of um, some some way to track and record that information. And it is the intent of the department to work with those small operators and build um, a template um, 
in Excel and, and work with small operators that need that extra assistance to build a type of uh, database management system for them and um, with tools to, um, to generate reports that would meet the intent of the compliance database report. Most of the large operators already have enhanced and en en environmental management databases where they're already tracking that information. Um, we are aware of, of very small operators that probably don't have that type of advanced database system. And so we, we, are, um, we, are, we will and are working on um, providing some type of template for those operators that need that kind of assistance. Thank you for that response. And I think in your testimony, you had also mentioned um, on NMED side and in general, it, you know, if these provisions go forward um, regarding the additional monitoring and the certification information, there's going to be a lot of new data. I think we can all agree. Um, and so on NMED side, do you um, have the databases to manage this data that would be coming in and this additional information? Yes, Madam Chair. The way that the the way that the role has been constructed is that these are records that are maintained by owners and operators, and they're not directly submitted to the department unless the department requests the information. And so, and we do have online compliance report systems that most of our um, permitted facilities are used to dealing with. Um, so we do have the systems in place to handle that data should we request um, that information. Okay, thank you so much for that. And then um, you had talked about, I think in your testimony about a, you know, some, because it will be more if the rules or provisions get get um, added into the, the rule, um, there will, you know, I think you mentioned a two year, pro, you know, time frame, and I think Mr. Heiser brought this up. Um, you know, depending on timing of the rule, um, what is your thought? You know, you said two years and then Mr. Heiser in his cross examination, you know, was, was also, um, concerned about the timing as well. If, if it got passed in the springtime a year, if, if, I guess my question is if, um, stakeholders needed that additional year or you know, to your point of two years, would that be allowable? Would the, work, or would NMED work with those um, those uh, those uh, stakeholders? We certainly will work with any stakeholders that are presented with real um, real issues, and and we'll try and address those and give them time if they need it. Uh, the, the current requirement is that the owners and operators d develop this database system within two years of the effective date of this part. So that gives them two full years to, okay. to get the system going. And it, it is our intent to assist those small operators with a template so that they have something um, that meets, meets the requirements of this part. Great. Thank you for that clarification. Um, that's all I have, Madam Hearing Officer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Vice Chair Trio Davis, do you have a question? Yes, thank you very much. Um, well, uh, thank you, Ms. Keene. I'm going to start with just by saying, uh, looking at this monitoring, I'm just trying to wrap my head around um, around it. The one of the companies I've worked for in the past had three employees that were dedicated to uh, air inspections, and that was their full time job was every month they they got a list and they went out and did did all of the air inspections required for Eldar, AVO and Flare in addition to um, our, our voluntary um, inspection program. So uh, the monthly inspections that NMED is proposing, are they at, they are outside as I understand it of the Eldar, AVO and Flare required inspections? There, this is just, this is a, a, a monthly inspection of equipment that is subject to this part. It's ensuring that the equipment is operating as intended and we can provide um, more specificity in the rule about what that monitoring should entail, but it is, it is an operational check of that equipment. 
and it is beyond the Eldar inspections and okay. beyond the specific um, like testing inspections or testing requirements for engines um, and other testing requirements that are in the rule. And did you receive any comments from any of the parties or was there any discussion around streamlining inspection events? So, and I'm not asking outside of monthly thing, but so that way a monthly inspection could cover a variety of inspections, possibly including flare or Eldar, any of those. That is exactly correct. There, we received one question about what the intent of the term monthly was, which I spoke to a minute ago. That was really, I think, the only comment we got on the term monthly, but it is um, operators should be able to streamline these inspections by, by covering that same inspection or by including that same monitoring requirement in their monthly inspection to streamline those requirements. Um, and is it a, is it the intent of the department to require operators to hire more employees that are dedicated to, to these inspections? So it may be necessary for some owners and operators to add employees to cover the, uh, these requirements. It, it's not our intent, but that may be, that may be the reality. And um, as we've seen in other portions of the rule, is there any issue with operators hiring consultants uh, to do it and certifying those um, results? No, they have, um, if you're a responsible official making decisions on behalf of the company, um, consultants can perform that type of a, a monitoring on behalf of the company. And in a previous testimony, I think the statement was made that there were in the past when consultants did that work, that there were errors made and that it got the company into some long term compliance issues and the department was trying to avoid that. Is that not a situation that you see happening here? So the, that conversation was about the PTE calculation and the need for an in-house engineer with specific experience to sign up on the PTE calculation. Mm -hmm. um, there are there's a requirement which we'll get to when we get to the um, control device and closement system section. There's a requirement for a closed system device certification, which is limited to in-house engineers. Um, there is not that same requirement for conducting the monitoring required under this section. Um, the owner or operators take that risk on when they when they hire consultants to do that type of work. It may result in future compliance issues for for the company. But the rule, it, this rule itself doesn't require that an engineer um, or that an employee of the company actually conduct this type of uh, monitoring events. We, we fully understand that um, not all owner or operators have access to the portable testing equipment or other, you know, just testing equipment um, that is typically done by outside, you know, third party testing companies, for instance. So that, that is still I authorized. Actually, that brings up a great question. So uh, about testing equipment, generally what uh, is required for testing equipment and do you have an idea of how much those that runs uh, just. So, so each section has a requirement for testing, right? So um, when we get to engines and turbines, we can talk about the emissions testing requirements that are part of that section. It's either a reference, it, there are options provided. Um, for the type of testing equipment that has to be used. Um, okay. It's either a portable analyzer or reference method test, and those tests can cost, you know, hundreds, hundreds to thousands of dollars per test. Um, okay. Has there been any, um, or is there a readily available information on what kind of initial investment uh, would need for testing equipment? or any operator, small or large? There's not been a specific study done on, on costs of testing equipment. Okay, and the reason I ask, because it kind of sticks in my head, um, we've heard a lot of people reference the cameras, and I believe last time I heard it was close to $100,000 for a, a camera. Is that 
sound about right? That's correct. Okay. Um, Member Trujillo Davis, I would just ask that. So there's all of that testimony is going to be presented with the Eldar section. So I, I think it's going to be much more helpful to have those discussions about the specific equipment and that type of issue when we get to those particular sections. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, I was just trying to kind of wrap my head around what monitoring would entail on a monthly basis. So, thank you, Ms. Keene, for asking for answering all my questions. Thank you. We have about another 5 minutes before we need to break for lunch. Uh, Member Cates, do you have questions? Yeah, um, I'm sort of interested in the redlining process. Um, so the, the, um. The, the, uh, the, the rule of text that we saw today, there's lots of redlining in it. And, um, you know, my question is along the lines of, well, you know, part of it is to address, I suppose this, you know, there is a belief among some people out there that the state rights rules at the behest of the uh, administration um, to, you know, tighten up the industry and that the state writes the rules and gives them to the industry and the industry um, rewrites them. And so, um, you know, so there's that perce perception, Ms. King, I was hoping you could just speak to that. Uh, so, so specific, specifically my questions then are the redlining comes from, does it come mostly from the uh, New Mexico oil and gas association? Does it come mostly from the, um, whatever the, uh, uh independent operator association is, is it a combination of those things? Um, do you do a round of edits? Do you just um, do you typically accept the edits that they propose? Um, it, I mean, that's that's just my sort of general line of questioning, and I was hoping you could explain, you know, go into that um, uh, a little bit without taking up, without taking up too much time. Sure, Member Cates, of course. We, we received um, edits from all the parties that are involved in this rulemaking proceeding and accompanied with their uh, their direct and rebuttal testimony, they're required to provide um, language to implement their the comments that they've made. And so all parties have submitted red line strikeout versions of language that they would like changed. We reviewed all of those comments that we received um, to the extent that we agreed that it provided clarification or um, was better um, stated or was more clear or more concise, we generally agreed that those edits could be made so long as they didn't um, change the intent of the requirement. In other cases, there were real um, te technical issues that were identified that had to be addressed, um, that were addressed in the red line version and with our direct and rebuttal testimony. And so um, we did not simply adopt um, changes by any party. Those were vetted. Those were carefully reviewed, carefully um, considered and, and vetted prior to making any changes to our, our draft rule. Um, and this version of the rule reflects comments received from all uh, stakeholders. Uh, and by all stakeholders, you mean, um, I, you know, wild earth guardians, for instance, you know, the environmentalist community and so on, right? Yeah, C correct. To the extent that we could agree with what the request was. Yeah, and do you have any feel for how you know how, what, what was what percentage of the edits did you accept? Was it half of them? Was it eighty? Was it was it a hundred percent? We received thousands and thousands of pages of uh, direct and rebuttal testimony, and yeah. sometimes the parties work together to to submit um, versions that they agreed to without consulting other parties. We had other uh, industry groups submitting their own that didn't necessarily agree with other parties. We had um, three, we had several stakeholders work together and agree with each other's comments on things. So it was like iterations. It was every iteration of, 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 of work of collaboration um, and not collaboration <laughs> between the parties. And so we had to look at the universe of the information that we received. Um, wh whittle it down to those um, things that we could accept and uh, make the necessary changes and, and kind of move on. But the it, each section was engaged with differently by different stakeholders. Yeah, and so, and, yeah. right. And it's, as you as you're as you're suggesting, it's a, it's a lengthy process. It 
takes that took weeks, months. We we worked yeah we were, we worked ninety hours a week, just reviewing comments and making edits. I mean we have done nothing for the last we've done nothing but that for the last uh, three months. Okay, so this didn't occur in a smoky back room in Santa no. Fe. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for your input. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Member Cates. I'm, I'm sorry we will not be able to take a full lunch break every day, um, uh, but today we must. Uh, we do have several public commenters at one, uh, so we'll accept that public comment and then we'll return to the questioning of Ms. Keene with Member Bitzer's questions. Thank you all. See you at one. Ms. Keene? I just want to tell you.